First John chapter 5, I'm going to read one verse, we'll word our prayer, and bring in a short message from this portion of scripture. First John chapter 5, and in verse 19. The Bible says, And we know that we are of God, and the whole world lieth in wickedness. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, dear God, for the good singing that we have heard this evening. It glorifies Jesus. I thank you, dear Lord, for the people that have made a good choice and decision to be in God's house this evening. And especially thank you for the Word of God that we have read and will read this evening. And I pray, sweet Holy Spirit of God, that you'd make the truth applicable in our lives, that Christ would alone be seen and be preeminent. And help us, dear Lord, and we ask you to forgive us of our sins. And we ask, dear God, that wherever the Word of God goes forth this evening, that somebody would get saved and a saint of God would be encouraged to serve you and that the Savior would be high and lifted up. And dear Lord, again, we commit the service unto you because we ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. 1 John chapter 5 and in verse 19, the Bible says, And we know that we are of God, and the whole world lieth in wickedness. And so from this, uh, this verse and from other truths that are contained in the Word of God, we could uh, title this lesson this evening, uh, The World Has Gone Crazy, But You Don't Have To. And so uh, you could look around and you don't have to be a Bible scholar to realize that this verse is true, that the world is, is dark and it's, it's getting worse. And the Bible says that it will get worse. And here he says, uh, and we know that we are of God and the whole world lieth in wickedness. There is kind of a like verse. I'm not saying it is a sister verse, but in Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 20, uh, the Bible says, Woe unto them that call evil good. And good evil, that put darkness for light, and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet, and sweet for bitter. That's the day and age in which we live. They are calling that which is evil good. They call the, the evil that is going on, that, that God claims is evil, they call that good. And when God condemns something, and uh, people call it good, it is that verse being lived out and coming to, to truth. There's a lot of things that are going on in the world today that uh, older people wouldn't have thought would have gotten to that degradation, if I can say that. And uh, it is, and it, it's getting worse. And the old adage is, is that uh, we, we get used to it because we are around it, and it is... It's the embodiment that they hold to, and it makes us get used to it. But uh, it, it's not right. It's against God. It's against good. It's against the Bible. And he sums it up when he says, The whole world lieth in wickedness. Now, God says that. So if God says that, then the whole world lies in wickedness. And basically, it's the truth that it's under control of the wicked one. The opposing force to God, the opposing person to God, is, is Satan himself. And so when he fell, we understand that he took a lot of helpers with him. Some would say from the reading of the scripture that he took a third of the angels with him that became demons. And so he has a lot of helpers. Satan is not omnipresent. God is omnipresent. But Satan knows human nature. And uh, Satan... He has a lot of help, and that's the demonic oppression that is all around you. Here's a good thing where the Bible says in verse 19, and we know that we are of God. So in basic biblical theology, it's this, that if you are a child of God, uh, Satan cannot possess you because you are indwelt with the Holy Spirit of God. And the Holy Spirit of God will uh, not allow 
Satan to possess the same vessel. However, you can be oppressed by the devil. And so there is a lot of oppression happening to God's children. But uh, sometimes uh, we help him. And uh, we, we don't want to help the devil in what he's doing. This devil, Satan, the wicked one and the names that he's given, he's called the God of this world. The Bible says that. He says that he is the prince of the power of the air. It says that in Ephesians 2.2. 2. The Bible says, Wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. That's Ephesians chapter 2 and in verse 2. And he says that uh, in times past we walked in that course. You may have been saved at an early age and, and praise God for that. But uh, you, you may be able to recollect before that that you, you walked according to the course of this world and according to the prince of the power of the air. But... The verse does not totally dismiss even a child of God that was saved at an early age because Ephesians 2.2 says, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. The basic interpretation of that is that in the, in the life of a lost person, you see the devil working in the life of a lost person and it's the, the only answer for why they behave it the way they do and what they do. But the truth of it is, is that a child of God can get into seasons of life of some disobedience and disobedience against God. And it is that spirit that works in their life as well. Men do according to their sinful natures. And I'm talking about people in general. They do according to the sinful natures and the lusts that they participate in. You notice this truth in 1 John in chapter 2 and in verse 16. The Bible says, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And so it would be very easy to get caught up in what the world is doing. And it's promoted and propagated all over the place. We talked about uh, the propaganda of the media. And the media certainly drives the action of a lot of people. And the thinking, and you have to be aware of that, and you have to be careful of that. And so the child of God has to be careful in the direction that they see themselves that they're going. And we're not to be involved in that. Because the Bible says to love not the world, the world system, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. There is contradiction there. And when he, when, he, when he speaks to us and says the, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life, that's not of the Father. And so you and I have to do a, a, a personal inventory and, and, and a check and see if we are being driven by the things of the flesh and the, the lust of what we see and the pride of life that says that we deserve that. So we have to be very careful. It'd be easy to, to get into all of those things. We're not to be involved in it. The world has gone crazy, but uh, you don't have to. In 1 John in chapter 5, verse 19, it says that in other places, we can understand that the condition that the world is, is it's getting darker. It's departing from God. It has. The world system is anti-God. It's anti-Bible. It's anti-Christ. We are heading in that direction. 
and we see it as we speak about prophetical truths and so forth. And, uh, and so this evening, how, how to keep from becoming like the world and, and steeped in that wickedness. After all, whenever somebody constantly sees something on TV and um, promoted in media, on the internet, and the world system, pretty soon we get to thinking, well, the majority of people are doing this. And then we also look around and we start saying, well, even the brethren are doing this. And then we start accounting for biblical truth and we, we say, well, uh, the Bible says that uh, if an individual continues in sin, they get chastened of God. And if an individual thinks that they're looking for some fruit, fruit inspectors or judging and they don't see chastening, it's kind of like, well, I may as well do it too. You may not outwardly say it, but it may lend itself to do that. Instead of having a reverential fear of God, then we start losing some of that because of the times and things that are going on. If a little child does not see mom or dad correct a sibling for what takes place, then that little child may participate in the same thing. If that child sees mom or dad uh, light a fire under the little sibling, they may not want to do that. And uh, sometimes parents grow weary in correction, but God doesn't. That's perfect. And sometimes we look around and we see brethren that are doing some things that we think, see how they're getting away with that. You and I are not to be involved in that, but we are to keep our fellowship with God the way that it ought to be. And so in this chapter, in 1 John chapter 5, how to keep from becoming like the world, steeped in the world, and uh, going crazy because of the world. It is basically by the things that you know. Now this chapter, when you, when you read this chapter, and I would encourage you as you go home this evening to read 1 John chapter 5, that uh, you, you would pick up that this is a no chapter, K-N-O-W. There are at least eight, I, I counted eight of the statements, either we know or may know, eight times in there. And so it is by the things that you know, and there's a lot of things that you can know simply by this chapter alone right here. And that it, it'll help you and it will, it'll help me as well. So how to keep from becoming like the world and steeped in its wickedness. Here's number one, is that you and I know the exchange that Christ made. And when I speak about the exchange that Christ made, you, uh, you, you can see this in verse uh, 18 where he says, we know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and the wicked one toucheth him not. When I speak about the exchange that Christ made, I'm speaking about this theological truth that is biblical terminology of being born again. Being born again is a Bible term. And he says that you are born of God, that you were saved, that you've been born again. And that happened because of an exchange that Christ made. You notice this. I'll hold my spot and go to 2 Corinthians 5, 21. And 2 Corinthians in chapter 5, verse 21 it speaks about this exchange that, I, that I'm talking about, that you know that this took place, and uh, you, you go back there often. 
So when I realized that there was a great exchange that took place for me being born again, and that Christ did this exchange for me, then that helps me when I look around and see what's going on in the world. It helps me so that I don't look around at what's going on in the world and say I'm at liberty to participate in those things because I also know that when I'm saved, I'm eternally saved. There are some children of God that get enough theology within themselves to have salvation and have it eternally, but they absolutely ruin their life while they're here. Because an individual that gets saved is not permitted to continue living in sin because they're saved eternally. When you get born again, you are saved eternally. But Romans chapter 6 says that we would not continue in sin. He's, in fact, it says, God forbid that we would continue in sin. And if we do, then we're wrecking our lives. We're hurting ourselves. And we're asking for the Lord Jesus to give us a heavenly spanking. That's what I, call, um, that's what I tell Ira. It's going to give you a heavenly spanking. And, uh, you know, you say, well, that, that's, that's going to make him fear God. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom, I think, is what the Bible says. Reverential fear. And he says here in 2 Corinthians 5 and 21 that this is this great exchange that took place. He says, For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And so when you pick the verse apart, he's speaking about uh, God the Father, God the Son, and you and I as a sinner turn saint. Because he says, for he, God the Father, made him, God the Son, to be sin for us who knew no sin. And so Christ was sinless. He knew no sin. That we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Now we're sinners. And we sin. In fact, we were born with a sin nature. And then when we reach the age of accountability, we sin willingly and also willfully. And it, it's like when you, when you tell the child that uh, don't touch that, it's hot. And, and typically the child has to find out. He, he wants to know if it's hot. And so he wants to touch it when you're not looking. And you tell the child to not sneak another cookie. And when you turn your head, they're going for the cookie jar. But it gets worse. And worse. And we're told don't do it. And the old sin nature wants to do that. Then the Bible tells us what to do. And we think that uh, we'll do it anyway. It's because of the old sin nature. And the Bible says here that Christ is sinless. And we understand that uh, he was sinless. But what it means is that uh, the exchange was is that God the Father allowed God the Son to bear our sins in his body. And so uh, these, uh, the, this robe of sinfulness, the, the, the rags of Isaiah chapter 6, the works of rags were put on Jesus on the cross. My sins were laid on him. And not only... Uh, my sins, but the sins of the whole world. That's why the Bible says that He is the propitiation for our sins. I love the word. He's the satisfaction for the sins of the whole world. That my sins were laid on Him, and they were many. Even when I got saved at a young age, the sins were many. The sin nature and the sins that would be committed were laid on Christ. And then he exchanged the sins that were laid on him for a robe of righteousness placed on you. It was a great exchange. And that you, you know that. You know it both theologically and, and you know it from an experience. That by the grace of God that you were a sinner bound for hell. And you became a saint of God through belief in the Lord Jesus Christ. Our sins for His righteousness. Notice this in Galatians chapter 1 verse 4. In Galatians chapter 1 verse 4, 
The Bible speaks of this world that we live in again. In a like fashion of 1 John 5, 19, where he says, Galatians 1, 4, who gave himself for our sins, talking about Christ, who gave himself for our sins, the sin payment, that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father. This is speaking about the exchange that Christ made. You and I understand this about the exchange that Christ made, our sins for his righteousness, and that we have been robed in his righteousness, all by the grace of God. When you look back at our text, and I'm talking about the world's gone crazy, but you don't have to, and the fact of how to keep ourselves from becoming like the world and steeped in its wickedness, it's by the things that you know. And so as we look around us and we are tempted to be involved in some of the things that go on around us, or we minimize and we say it's not that bad, or we say that everybody's doing it, including some of the brethren are doing that, then we go back in mind to the time that we got saved and realize this great exchange that took place. Christ was sinless. And yet he took my sins in his body on the tree when he was on the cross. And uh, it wasn't pleasant. It, it grieved him. There in the garden when he drank the cup of the wrath of God. And it grieved him knowing what he would have to do. We know the exchange that Christ made. In verse 18 of 1 John chapter 5, we know the expectation, or I'm sorry, the expectation of Christ. In verse 18, we know the expectation of Christ and we uh, live it in our Christian life. You cannot live it before that you get saved, but you have been given the power through the Holy Spirit of God to live it after that you get saved. You and I do not have to continue in sin. In verse 18, the Bible says, We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. But he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth him not. There is a lot of discussion, you could say debate, interpretation on this verse because an individual would say, now Brother Spears, uh, um, I've sinned since I've got saved. And, and I would say, since I've got saved, I've sinned. So the, the verse in its meaning is that you don't continue in sin, continue sinning. But it also means that within you now, you have a twofold nature. And when you were saved, born again, the Holy Spirit of God came in to indwell you. You have a new nature in you, the born again nature. And that born again nature does not sin because it is born of the Holy Spirit of God. And the Holy Spirit of God does not sin. And yet you have an old nature. And Paul talks about it in Romans 7, this old nature, oh wretched man that I am. But it does mean that you don't continue in sin. Because the Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. And old things have passed away, but all things have become new. If an individual can make a profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and then go right back to the slop and the mire, there is an indication that the individual never got saved. And so it is one of those passages that is a flag for an individual that says they got saved and so most I call it like a check mark salvation. It's kind of like been there, did that. And they got saved and now there's absolutely no fruit in their life that they got saved. It does not look like there's any change in the individual's life. It's a, it's a flag, it's a question mark. But I'm talking about for the true child of God that you not only know the exchange that Christ made, it was very costly, the precious blood of Jesus. My sins were laid on him, his righteousness on me and you as well. If 
you're a saved individual, but you know the expectation of Christ since you got saved is that you don't continue in sin. That you know Christ as an expectation that you and I don't continue in sin, and if you do sin, He is provided for that. 1 John 1, 9. And when the Holy Spirit of God speaks to your heart and says, you shouldn't have said that. You shouldn't have looked at that. You shouldn't have said that. I like to apply it in my life where the Holy Spirit of God is so personal that he says, uh, uh, David, you need to quit thinking like that. And I dismiss it if I'm in the will of God. Don't dwell on it. David, you ought not go there. David, you ought not say that. And he does you as well. That's the indwelling Holy Spirit of God. And at that moment, I have a choice not to go there, not to say that, not to see that. And sometimes I get to victory and sometimes I don't get to victory and I have to pause and stop and confess and forsake that sin. And you need to as well. But we attempt to live out the expectation of Christ. We know the expectation. You notice this in 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2, just back a few pages. In verse 21, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21. The Bible says, For even hereunto were you called. You see, a child of God is called. When he got saved, it was because God called. It was because the Holy Spirit of God, he spoke to your heart. And the Lord Jesus Christ if I be lifted up, will draw all men unto me. He says, For even hereunto were you called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow in his steps. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judges righteously. Who his own self bare our sins in his own body, on the tree that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness whose, by whose stripes ye were healed for you were a sheep going astray but are now returned to the shepherd and bishop of your souls it's talking about Christ watching over your soul and he says that we as a child of God being dead to sin dead to sin not living in sin that you and I would know and live out the expectation of Christ. What, what's it mean? It means resisting the devil. It means that I don't want to look like the world and I'm not going to allow the world to dress me. I'm not going to act like the world and allow the world to be my conduct. I don't want to talk like the world and, and so forth. And I'm going to, to come out. And so I, I need to know the expectation of Christ. And then I also know that from our text of knowing the exalted Christ. I know the exchange that Christ made for my sin and my soul. It was my sins laid on him, his righteousness made on, laid on me. And then I know the expectation that Christ has for me that I would not continue in sin, in sinning. And when I sin, that I confess it and forsake it. And then I know that Christ is exalted. In verse 20, the Bible says of our text, 1 John 5, 20, and we know, and we know that the Son of God has come and has given us an understanding that we may know Him that is true, and we are in Him that is true, even in His Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. This is the exalted Christ. That yes, Christ came as the babe in the manger, and that he lived a perfect and sinless life. And, but yet he was spit upon. He was ridiculed. He was mocked. And then he was crucified on a cross. But now he's exalted. He was buried in a tomb. He rose again the third day. He was seen of over 500 at one time. And then he ascended back on high. And tonight he's sitting on the right hand of God the Father. And tonight he's looking down upon his children. 
Tonight, he's making intercessory prayer for his children. Tonight, even though in heaven, he understands what's going on in the church. Tonight, even though in heaven, he understands what's going on in each and every life. He can do a walk through of the church. He can see if it's bringing honor to Christ. He can do a walk through in the life of the child of God. He's omnipresent. He's everywhere at all times. Beholding the evil and the good. He knows why I'm here. He knows why you're here. He knows your need. He knows the deepest thoughts. The recesses of your mind. And we understand him and know him as the exalted Christ. Acts 2.33, the Bible says, Therefore, being on the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he hath shed forth this, which ye now see and hear, speaking about the coming of the Holy Spirit of God. Where Christ, when he got done with his, uh, his, his, his high priestly work, if you will, of taking the blood, when he shed his blood at, at Calvary on the cross, I believe that he presented it at the mercy seat there in heaven for the atonement once for all and to sit down at the right hand of God the Father and then the Holy Ghost of God came and indwells every child of God teaching us, guiding us and he'll be with you tomorrow. We see the Exalted Christ, for the Bible says in Philippians 2 and 9, Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, and you're named with that name, that Christ is with you and shall be in you through the Holy Spirit of God, and you are now a son of God. He came into his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. And you name the name of Christ. You name the name of the only begotten Son of God. That's how the whole world lies in wickedness and has gone crazy, but you don't have to. Because of the exchange that Christ made. Because of the expectation that Christ has for you as a child of God. And because of the exalted Christ. And then you see that you know and you participate in the very exhortation of Christ himself. In verse 20 again, the Bible says, And we know that the Son of God has come and hath given us an understanding that we may know him that is true. And we are in him that is true. Even in his son, Jesus Christ, this is the true God and eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. This is participating in exhorting Christ. This means that wherever that you go tomorrow, you are more than happy. To tell somebody about Jesus. It's, it's coming out of you to tell somebody about Jesus. We had a good day at church. What you do at church. We exhorted Christ. High and lifted up. Uh, you don't have to do that. You know that God loves you. And that God died for you. Jesus died for you. God has better things for you. Every individual person is a soul who Christ died for. Every individual soul is worth more than the world. Every individual soul could get saved. These, there's the, the exhortation of Christ. He is truth personified. Bible says, little children, keep yourselves from idols. Simply means keep yourself from anything that comes between you and the Savior. 
Let me make this quick list of statements, and I won't preach them because of time. I understand that, and I understand that this could be a lesson within itself. But let me let me make these these statements that uh, where the Bible says we know in verse eighteen that whosoever is born of God sinneth not or does not continue in sin, but he that is begotten of God, meaning born again, keepeth himself. He keepeth himself. Now you don't keep yourself saved. God keeps you saved. But there is the expectation that you now in the family of God would keep yourselves from participating in some things. It's the old adage where the parents say to the, the child, uh, this is this family and these are the rules of this family. We don't do those things. And sometimes the family has to limit where the child plays or who the child plays with because <coughs> the other family doesn't hold to that same regard. It's not being better. It's just saying in this family we don't do those things. We don't, we don't go there. And so in God's family there's things that he says in our family we, we don't do those types of things. And he says, but he keepeth himself. And, and you have the propensity to do the things that the world is doing, but you don't because you keep yourselves. And so here are some helpful thoughts in that, in you keeping yourself. And again, I won't preach them, but I will give them to you. But when you, when you keep yourself, he's speaking about holistically, the, the whole you, that you would keep your eyes on Jesus. And it's Hebrews 12 too, looking unto Jesus. That is to guard and guide you when you leave this church tonight and until we meet again, and hopefully that you'll be here on Wednesday evening, that you will keep your eyes on Jesus. Looking unto Jesus, the verse says, the author and the finisher of our faith. He began it and he'll carry you through and end it until faith becomes sight. The Bible says, for, for the joy that was set before him, endure the cross, despising the shame, and to sit down at the right hand of God the Father, that you keep your eyes on Jesus. The psalmist said in Psalm 101, verse 3, I will set no wicked thing before my eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave unto me. And so positively, when you leave church tonight and you go home and turn on the media, you be careful and determine, does this draw me closer to Christ, further from Christ, and, and so forth. You keep your eyes on Jesus. Number two, you keep your ear open to the Word of God. In Psalm 78, verse 1, the Bible says, Give ear, O my people, to my law. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. What does it mean? It means that when you leave here, you get some Bible in you before you pillow your head. And when you wake up, you get some Bible in you as soon as you get up and listen for God's words. Listen for God to speak to you. God wants some alone time with you, child of God. Individually, God wants to speak to you as individuals. He has a word for you. He has a word for the day through the word of God. Number three, you keep your feet moving in the right direction. And I'm talking about staying straight. In Hebrews 12, 13, the Bible says, And make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. Make a straight path for your feet. You stay straight. The psalmist put it this way in Psalm 119, verse 59. I thought on my ways and turned my feet unto thy testimonies. I thought on my ways. And he's speaking about the word of God. And when he thought on his ways, he, he's thinking on his ways. And he says, does that align to the word of God? And when he's saying that, he is, he is meaning, I thought on my ways. And my ways, for that moment, was not going towards the word of God. And so I got him going in the straight direction. I, I turn them to the Word of God. Number four, you keep your heart fixed on the promises that are contained in the Word of God. Where the psalmist said in Psalm 45, 1, My heart is indicting a good matter. I speak of the things which I have made touching the king. My tongue is the pen of a ready writer. 
He's saying that he wants to speak the things of God. His heart is fixed on the things of God, not the things of the world. Here's number five. You keep your tongue speaking right things. Proverbs 15, 2, the Bible says, The tongue of the wise uses knowledge right, but the mouth of foolish or fools pour out foolishness. Here's number six. You keep your hands involved with the work of God. It means be involved. I, I want to say this, that this church needs you. Uh, the local church needs you. And God needs you to be uh, in your place and to be involved. Psalm 90 verse 17, the Bible says, And let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us, and establish thou the work of our hands upon us. Yea, the work of our hands, establish thou it. And he's speaking about the work of God. And then last, you keep your expectation on the return of Christ. It's looking for it and hastening the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Where John the Beloved on the Isle of Patmos said, Even so come, Lord Jesus. Even so come, Lord Jesus. That, that's how you and I can live in this world that is anti-God, anti-Bible, anti-Christ, and not become like that. And to keep ourselves from idols. Ponder those thoughts. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, dear God, for the Word of God, the truth that is contained therein, and that, dear Lord, that you have saved and separated the people unto you. Help us this week to be able to get the victory through the Word of God. And, dear Lord, to separate and come out from among them and not touch those things. And to keep ourselves from idols or to keep ourselves from those things that come between us and you. Help every individual here, dear God, to get the victory through the Word of God. And that, dear Lord, that uh, we would... Be a blessing, receive a blessing because of you. We ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.